think of a bottle of pop, right? And oddly, for people of my generation, the fact that it's called coronavirus is, is strangely pertinent to a, an analogy involving a bottle of pop. So there's a bottle of pop that's been shaken up, so it is going to overflow. So what the government is seeking to do is minimise the amount of spillage. If you put a lid on that bottle and shake it and then take it off straight away, their argument is it would be a heck of a lot worse the minute you take the lid off than it would have been if you'd never put the lid on in the first place. Or if you'd put the lid on and then waited for the pop inside the bottle to calm down so that when you do remove it, it will still overflow, but not on the scale that it would have done if you'd taken the lid off sooner. I think that works. It, well, look, it works for me, at least. I, I, and I'm you know, I'm not a complete dope. So that, that helps me get an idea of why the government is doing what they're doing. But then, then you read this. This is, a, I don't really know. I mean, the thing about gambling is if you win, you're a genius. And if you lose, you're dead. Right? So <laughs> this line here is the one that stayed with me out of all the media coverage this morning. This is a remarkable gamble by Mr. Johnson, albeit one that the government insists is informed by science. All right, pause there. Because if this was America, we would yesterday have seen Boris Johnson say something to the waiting world and then seen Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, turn around and say, well, actually, we're, we're, we're failing. We should probably be honest about that. So we're not in as bad a place as we could be by any stretch of the imagination. But pay attention. Essentially, the Prime Minister has concluded that there is little the government can do to stop the virus spreading widely and that ultimately there is little point trying to prevent it from doing so. The best way to protect the public from the virus in the long term, this government has calculated, is for the population, for most of the population to get it, thereby giving it herd immunity to further waves of the disease. OK, the government's priority instead should be merely to try to slow the spread of COVID-19 to avoid the NHS becoming overwhelmed during the coming months. So when the bottle explodes or when the bottle overflows, it will do so in a way and at a time that gives us a better chance of cleaning up, that gives us a smaller amount of spillage. But this is the line, guys. I never say guys on the radio. That's a mark of how serious this is. I normally talk directly to you as an individual rather than having any sense of addressing a, a, an audience or a crowd. The consequences of Mr. Johnson's gamble is that many more families will indeed lose loved ones than might have done if the government took more extreme measures to stem the spread of the disease. Right, might have done. Not will have done, but might have done. There is no way at the moment that I can read this situation without concluding that Boris Johnson is gambling with our loved ones' lives. I, I'm knocking at the door of telling you now that he has no choice. Because if he did it another way round, and he now did cancel everything, and it turned out that when we come out of quarantine or, or, or isolation or whatever you want to call it, and there was an explosion that wouldn't have happened if we'd done what he's doing now, that would also be gambling with our loved ones' lives. I don't think many people who've listened to this program for more than a nanosecond have any uh, doubts at all about where I place Boris Johnson on a scale of integrity, professionalism and probity. But that doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter now. I also think it's important to point out that this appeal to expertise is not massively helpful because at the moment it's two experts some people trying to have a little bit of fun with brexit analogies and goodness knows normally i'd be in the front of that particular queue but there's no parallel here because the broad consensus of informed expertise during brexit was all one way that's why the leave campaign had to denigrate experts it's why michael gove had to say what he said it's why we ended up treating andrea ledson with the same reverence as Pascal Lamy or treating Digby Jones as if he knew what he was talking about. Uh, the, 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 there, was, there was a very, very broad consensus of proper experts, economic, scientific, political, and uh, the people that denigrated the experts, the people that thought Andrea Leadsom knew more about the WTO than the bloke that ran the WTO, they won. So the parallel doesn't work, because I've got two experts now, Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty, who seem to be swimming against the tide, of the rest of the world's scientific expertise. So I think 
I mean, I understand why people are doing it, but it's not helpful. It isn't just suddenly people who normally like experts suddenly don't like experts. It's people who normally think that we should follow scientific consensus with as big a number of experts as possible still think that. Well, some of you do. And I don't know that the British government's response is, well, it isn't of a piece, is it, with what the international majority of scientific expertise seems to be. But then again, Italy, I think you could argue quite persuasively, have got it wrong. That's why they've had to move so drastically so quickly. And any suggestion, therefore, that we should be more like Italy or that Italy's quarantine policies or Italy's red notices should be emulated here is daft. And then you read that line again about the gamble that many more families will indeed lose loved ones than might have done if the government took more extreme measures to stem the spread of the disease. Boris Johnson is a coward. It's it's quite a helpful observation, that. And I think his cowardice will serve as well at the moment because he really will be uh, asking the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer to save his bacon. And that is why I have some confidence that we should follow and we should have faith in the government's advice. The problem is, as soon as I say that out loud, I know that you are thinking, well, what about Austria? What about Germany? What about Ireland? I mean, Ireland now, when I bid you farewell yesterday, I honestly thought it was about an 80% certainty that the UK would follow Ireland's lead. Five minutes after coming off air, I, I was disabused of that notion by somebody who's very plugged into the government, somebody who, who um, gave me a quick heads up and gave me a quick ring and, and, and they said, no, I don't think they're going to. I think as it stands, they're going to announce what you should do if you think you might have it, but they're not going to make any big public policy pronouncements comparable to the ones that Leo Varadkar, <sighs> brackets a doctor, close brackets, who happens to be Taoiseach of Ireland, announced yesterday. And if Ireland are getting it wrong... What's the worst that can happen? People who might have lived will die. And if the UK is getting it wrong, what's the worst that can happen? People who might have lived will die. What I haven't got yet, and what I hope we can work out, or at least work towards together this morning, what I haven't got yet is a really clear, I mean my bottle of pop analogy notwithstanding, but a really clear account of what the science actually is. And that worries me as well, because... Again, to draw parallels with previous episodes in which perhaps competing opinions have both claimed to have the support of experts, at least you could see the science, you know, at least if you were talking about what impact Brexit might have upon the Good Friday Agreement, you could read the Good Friday Agreement and you could see, if you had your eyes open, that there was no earthly way it could survive the UK, the whole of the UK, being entirely out of the single market and the customs union. It was, it was obvious. Well, I think it was obvious. It's maybe not a great example. But we don't have the science that they're basing these opinions on. And here's the other thing. The behavioural element of it that we seem to be leaning on more heavily than any other country, I don't know what it's based upon, and I don't know that anybody has told us look i'm one pair of eyes i do this for a living so i probably spend more time plugged into the news than you do i'm not even going to tell you what my twitter stats were for the last week it's frankly terrifying probably grounds for divorce but i haven't heard it doesn't mean it hasn't happened there's a couple of things i've missed but i haven't heard what the precedents are i've read the government's um it's at gov.co.uk and you can see it on my twitter feed if you want the the government's sort of flu planning documents which cite the 2011 pandemic as one precedent but what are they modeling the behavioral science on because nothing like this has happened on our watch so if they're saying well when we gave out advice about foot and mouth after a few weeks people didn't follow it that i don't know that doesn't work for me because if people stopped washing their boots on the way out of a field during foot and mouth because they'd got bored of washing their boots, I can see some sense in saying that's evidence that people get expertise fatigue. But if that field they were in was full of dead cows, they'd have washed their blinking boots, right? So there are too many gaps 
at the moment for us to be properly confident. But, and, and uh, there's nothing I can say today that's going to have everybody listening nodding. Nothing at all. I think that's true most days. But when you're facing a global health pandemic, a global health crisis, uh, when people are going to die, and the number of people who die is in some sense going to be determined by the decisions of a politician, a politician of almost uniquely amoral outlooks, but that cowardice is a huge help there, then I think we need more. I think we need more data, don't we? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. So if you if you were foolish enough to follow my lead, if you decided to put your decision in my hands this morning, I would say that we're right to follow the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer's advice. I would also ask them to tell us a little bit more about the reasoning behind it and about the data that they're drawing on. Because the more I read about this nudge unit, the more I wonder whether the word science actually deserves to be applied at all. And when the government appeals to scientific evidence, this is where the scientific evidence leads, without telling us what the scientific evidence is, well, I'm afraid that is as meaningless intellectually as the phrase will of the people. It means nothing. Especially when other states and other governments are citing scientific evidence as their basis for doing the precise opposite of what we're doing.